On August 24th, 2022, President Hakiende Hachilima marked one year in office. Have things changed since he took over from Edgar Lungu? The economy was a major factor that brought many voters out, particularly young Zambians. Is he living up to his economic promises to them? And then we'll get into the gig economy. While this may be a new phrase for you, there are millions of Africans across the continent who participate in the gig economy. And from there, since it's Friday, it's Stock Market Watch. The Nairobi Exchange is experiencing some turbulent times. We'll have the details of this, even though there have been stronger than expected half-year earnings. What does this all mean? All of these questions and, of course, conversations right here on Business Edge. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Rubalogun. African Business Headlines is up first. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, has recommended that South Africa overhaul its tax regime for funding economic growth. The organization recommended that the country enhance its reforms and reduce inequality now that it's reached the limit of budget adjustments that were aimed at reducing fiscal deficits and reining in debt. A $750 million African Exports Import Bank loan has finally been paid into the Bank of Ghana's account. However, the BOG will take the dollars and give the CD equivalent to the government. This will go a long way to boost the central bank's reserves, a move that could also help slow down the rates of depreciation of the city against the dollar. The Central Bank of Kenya has reopened two long-term bonds seeking to raise 50 billion Kenyan shillings from fixed-income investors. The government's fiscal agent is offering a 15-year security, which was first sold in April at an average interest rate of 13.94%. A 10-year paper, which was auctioned in May at an average interest rate of 13.49%, is also on offer. And the Chinese-built Ethiopia-Djibouti Railway has started vehicle shipment from ports in Djibouti to Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian capital. The first vehicle shipment arrived at the Indode freight station on the outskirts of Addis. A special ceremony was held at the station to mark the arrival of this shipment. Those are a few African business headlines for you at this time. Our first conversation comes up right after the break, just one year after President Hakiende Hachilima's historic win in Zambia. What is the economy telling us about his leadership? Stick around. Twenty twenty one was a landmark year for Zambia. Two important events occurred. The passing of the first president of independent Zambia, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, was mourned in June. And then in August, the people of Zambia voted decisively for change. Zambians voted in a businessman who had contested five previous elections and won on his sixth run for office. It has now been just 365 days since President Hakiende Hachilima took office in Zambia. At the time, the country's economy was suffering serious challenges now, depending on who you ask, the answer to whether or not President Hachilema has lived up to his promises swings either way. So what has changed since the president's first year in office? Joining me from Lusaka, Zambia, is Shibamba Kayama. He's an economist and former communication officer at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, welcome once again. Long time, as we would say, in Nigeria. Shibamba, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure once again. So I think it's good for this conversation for us to establish the economic situation of things for Zambia when President Hachilema uh, took office, particularly looking at the debt situation, inflation, uh, the currency, as well as unemployment uh, for the country. So take us through what that looked like just 365 days ago. Yeah, um, we have seen a significant drop um, in the inflation rate from 24.2% just about a year ago, to be at about 9.8% uh, today. That, that's a significant achievement. Um, we also have seen stability uh, in the exchange rate. Uh, at the time, uh, President Hakainde Hichilema took over power. The exchange rate was about 22 quarter 
um, to the US dollar, almost getting to 23 quarter per US dollar. And uh, today it has significantly dropped to be at about 16 quarter, 20 way uh, per US dollar. Um, that's a significant gain for the quarter just over one year period. And we also know that it's, it's really been seen as one of the best performing currencies globally at the mm. moment. Another key uh, achievement um, is um, the reserves. At the time, uh, President Hakan Ichilema took over power, though the, the special drawing rights were just being um, handed over to Zambia by the IMF, we know that we only had about one month worth of import cover, just about 1.4 billion uh, quacha. I mean, uh, dollars in the reserves. Today, we took nearly uh, 4 billion, uh, which almost three months uh, import cover, three to four months import cover, a huge, huge, huge improvement. And this alone has uh, heightened levels of confidence in the economy. We employment, uh, it has had a very big chunk of this one. I think this is one biggest achievement so far, uh, where is employed um, uh, in total about 40, thousand teachers and health workers um, to me this been a significant achievement for him and for his government mm -hmm. uh, overall we're also registering economic growth rate now about 1.4 percent from a minus 2.2 percent just about a year ago and to me this also signifies that policies are working um, to my pleasure it's really the negotiations with the creditors, external creditors to Zambia, yes. who have uh, now agreed to a framework of uh, that will be led by the International Monetary Fund Program for Zambia. So okay. we are able to restructure external debt and this will give some relief for uh, Zambia's fiscal position. All right, so we'll get into the creditor situation, uh, but let's start off with the IMF particularly. And we know that there were attempts by previous administrations to unlock some form of bailout and some form of uh, credit facility, but those never came into play. And just around, I know we spoke about it last year, that the IMF was waiting to see what would happen with the elections before another decision would happen. But just a few months after he was elected, uh, Zambia clinched a $1.4 billion three-year credit line from the IMF. So what made it possible for the Hachilema administration to do what others had failed to do? Um, I, I think it's a level of commitment. You see, having said at the International Monetary Fund as advisor myself, I understand that confidence at the very Chibamba. Okay, please go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so I am with much more collaborative and understanding and listening. So all I would say is that um, we will see. We, we have seen a, a, a direct engagement with IM based on some thresholds that they, they set themselves. Apparently, Zambia itself set its own motion. It set its own uh, conditionalities for this uh, facilitation of the IMF. And uh, one of the issues had to do with the transparency. IMF would like to, to have transparency. So the, the, the thing that happened, uh, and this is really as a result of the advisors who came in uh, with the previous regime, um, Highgate, where, uh, and, and Lazifer, the, the Lazard, Lazard were international credit consilers who helped to reconcile all debt that Zambia owes, domestic debt, international debt, all this, including the names of the creditors. And this is the, one of the areas of transparency that the creditors were looking for. So President Hakan Echulema and uh, his government were able to engage um, with uh, proper data, um, the data that the creditors wanted to, to know, who owes who and under what terms were these dates sitting. So that disclosure was sufficient to win the support of the IMF. Uh, remember that the IMF equally wanted a commitment from the Zambian government on the issue of fiscal discipline, yes. which has worked so far. If you see these variables, 
the macroeconomic variables that have changed now are a result of fiscal discipline and commitment. You know, reining in on expenditure, unnecessary expenditure, reining in on new debt. The moment you show a commitment that we shall not acquire a new debt, you are actually bring the IMF out to, your, to the table. Okay. So from the very way go in December last year, the IMF has, has led these discussions and that's how the two are now working together. So let's talk about a bit of the conditions a bit more. So with the IMF credit facility, as you mentioned, uh, they've pushed really that Zambia must be transparent and meets with its official creditors. Um, and we're seeing that happen. We'll talk about the pace of that. But there's also the conversation around suitable reforms. And we know that there is a a history with the IMF, with the World Bank, when it comes to these sort of structural reforms that they demand of African economies, going back to the structural adjustment programs. So in terms of these reforms that the IMF has been looking at and the conditions, and you said that there has been some fiscal discipline, has the president brought in austerity measures? Because there's also the conversation around the subsidies and possibly him having to remove some of these subsidies. So in this past one year, what is the fiscal discipline that has come into play? What austerity measures may have also come into play uh, for Zambians to try to get past this time? Apparently, there hasn't really been any austerity measures per se. On the contrary, we have seen the IMF uh, for the first time uh, approving what they could not ordinarily um, approve. Uh, how do you employ 40,000 civil servants within a, a, a given budget year. The IMF was certainly engaged about this. Initially, the IMF would have resisted this. Mm -hmm. The IMF would have done the opposite, recommended the opposite, that a new restructure retrench the civil service. We want a lean civil service for us to fund him. But they allowed the opposite to happen and get more civil servants on board, employ more of these people. The IMF also approved uh, what we is called uh, uh, expanding the uh, com uh, the constituency development funds. These are um, allocations by government to constituencies for them to spend on various projects, including entrepreneurship. Ordinarily, you would not want to see that kind of expenditure dispersed to communities because I would see that as a wastage. But it, it approved, not really approved, it was notified about it and had no qualms with it. Um, and uh, another area is um, social cash transfer. Uh, uh, by the way, within the, um, the terms of agreement with IMF, there, there is a line, and I know it's the last line, of expanding and ensuring much more transparency on social cash transfer. This is free money given to the most vulnerable people. And the IMF is insisting that once the program kicks in, they would like expansion, even a further more expansion in protection of the most vulnerable people, mm. the poor. It, under the structural adjustment programs, these things were never heard of. IMF advised against such expenditure, social investment expenditure. Today, the IMF is at the forefront to protect the most vulnerable. Uh, the other areas that may be considered austerity measures are uh, economic reforms, maybe to do with uh, uh, rationalizing uh, and subsidies on energy, rationalizing subsidies on agricultural inputs. Uh, uh, many people have, have uh, sent the message that IMF wants to scrap uh, subsidies, wants to ensure there is no subsidy on agriculture. IMF has simply advised a rationalization. Mm. In other words, these subsidies should be targeted to the actual beneficiaries to remove a, a, a case of corruption, where the people who win out of these subsidies are the, are, are the least affected of uh, any economic program. So IMF is not saying remove this, they simply rationalize, ensure that um, it's transparently done, the actual winners are the most vulnerable, and that is how the whole thing has been running. So the, and, and these conditionalities are actually the best way of running government. Any government that wants to survive must institute these measures even without the involvement of the International Monetary Fund.
Very true. So let's talk about China now. China happens to be the elephant in the room, but now it's looking more like a partner that may be sitting across the table. China agreeing to the debt uh, negotiation conversation as a major creditor. And of course, many of us across the continent are looking at these conversations to see what precedent it may set for other low-income countries. But beyond that, we've seen China establish a new Chinese Chamber of Commerce uh, in Lusaka. We also saw the president of China have a personal phone call uh, with President um, Haichile as well and he promised a sympathetic Chinese approach to Zambia's debt so going forward particularly the negotiations are on they don't seem to have really kicked into high speed or more of the intense part of it what are we expecting how critical are these negotiations to uh, the president's success particularly for his tenure in the remaining three years three or so years yeah, I, I call it a win-win engagement in the sense that uh, at the time of winning election, President Haka and the Chilemas government were very, very cautious about how to deal with China. Um, China was a very close friend of the uh, uh, previous regime. It financed most of the projects. And China is seen uh, will be at the center of what's being investigated today on the lines of um, uh, corruption. So the much of the date that's under contention have to do with China. Yes. Most of the uh, creditors, commercial creditors, particularly those from Europe, could not come to the table largely because they felt the negotiations with China were not transparent enough. They wanted to know what was really in there. It has taken some quite of time to bring China on the table because China also had expectations from this government that we want to continue with you. We want to continue to invest in Zambia. We want to continue with partnerships. And we saw an opportunity, therefore, that uh, for Zambia's debt to be restructured, China has come onto the table, and that's how we are now seeing China and Zambia discussing. So what I see is that uh, Chinese coming on the table opened the room for the IMF program. This has been very, very significant, because without China coming to the table, we would not have had this program that is now um, almost written. So uh, we will see significant change in terms of how we treat Chinese debt now. It has to be very transparent, and we have to be very open on who do we pay, who do we service, uh, but the good news, of course, for us is we now have a sufficient headroom uh, in, in terms of fiscal space to, to spend on the local needs. We don't have to be under pressure uh, to service external debts that we are making everything unsustainable. All right, so we can't have this conversation marking the president's one year without talking about the mining industry. Uh, and we know Zambia for a while has been locked in some situations with uh, Vedanta as well as Glencore. But also this past year, we saw the Canada-based first quantum minerals announce a $1.25 billion expansion of one of its copper mines and a new $250 million nickel mine. So there are some criticisms from the opposition that government is giving the multinationals too many tax breaks and too many incentives. Yes, they will provide jobs, but is there a way for uh, Zambia to recoup, to make some money in terms of revenue contribution? So how do you think the president has handled the mining issue? It's a contentious issue, of course, by many, many Zambians. But as you know, that mining is um, a key source of revenues. About 75% of uh, external earnings come from the copper mining sector. It is also the highest contributor to GDP. And it's arguably the biggest employer when you consider the value chains as well in the country. So it's a very sensitive uh, line of business in this country. Now, what this government did was to listen more. There have been significant discussions, and I've said this on this program before, that last year in May, before even this government came into place, there was some endeavor, some discussion between government and the mining sector to look at the double taxation aspect. You know, we, we haven't really expanded. Despite the copper resource and other minerals being abundant in Zambia, we have had and exploration activities. A number of projects are in the offing, largely because the financiers to these projects are saying look, the return on the mining in Zambia is not very positive, it's not good. When it is um, rated with other international, uh, other mining companies across the block, Zambia was seen to give the, the lowest return of 7%, unlike 15%, which is acceptable everywhere else. And as a result, in terms of opportunity cost, they found it worthwhile to invest elsewhere and uh, away from Zambia. Now, what this government did was to not uh, run, run around what was discussed in May, but implement the, the royal mineral royalties uh, to be tax deductible for corporate income tax. 
So they still pay the mineral oil taxes, but this time they should be considered as a, as a cost. And of course, this is a revenue loss for this country. However, this is going to lead to expansion in mining sector. We are going to see much more exploration activities and much more recapitalization of the existing mines. As you heard from First Quantum Minerals already, they are expanding production. They are committing so much. And uh, the, the best win for us is in the value chain, in the supply chain, ensuring that domestic suppliers are considered as a priority. That is the way you win in the mining sector. And of course, there are other gray areas in the sense that the mining companies are old in VAT, and they are accounted these for future tax declarations that they should be discounted first until such a time where government um, uh, debt to the mining sector is zero. Mm. All right, so Chibamba, we'll wrap this up with a score, and I'm going to put you on the <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot here on a scale of one to ten. Uh, when you look at this past 365 days of the president's tenure, the moves he's made, the discussions he's had, there's been a lot of regional interplay as well. Uh, there's economic policy, there's diplomatic policy, all of this at play. How well do you think the president has done in living up to the promises that he made to the electorate? to the things he said on the campaign trail that really ended up bringing out young Zambians in such a historic election. The, the reason I'm going to give this number, just give me a chance to explain why I'm going to give the number I'm going to give, is because when you are taking over government, number one, you really underestimate the magnitude of the problem you find on the ground. So he underestimated the magnitude of the problem on the ground. That's number one. Number two is you are dealing with the civil service. To implement most of this program, the civil service is, is, is facing a transition and they are really scared to implement and sign in on new projects. So that has affected the way he's operating, even in terms of changing the laws and so forth. So you find the lead time to changing anything now is taking three times longer than he thought. And for this reason, I'm going to give a 6.5 out of a 6.5 out of 10. All right, it's better than an average, but it does leave room for growth and improvements as well. Chibamba Kayama, it's good to see you again, and we'll continue our conversations at another time. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. And of course, many of us were focused on Zambia with those historic elections and also focused on Zambia in 2020 when the country became the first African nation to default on its loans in the COVID era. And this is just about two years down the line and the significant changes have been very visible. But while there are numbers to this, there are also people to this. Does the average Zambian believe that their life is different and better now under this new administration? It's a conversation we'll continue another time, but we still have more conversations for you today. This is Business Edge. Don't go away. Up next, I have international business stories. Stick around.